at least last speaker, keynote speaker, uh, we started a conference with, uh, you know, how the new, let's say, platform economy was enabled by APIs. Then we talked about going beyond the new normal for the new reasonable, right? And this morning we had keynotes about uh, uh, like how sometimes innovation, Silicon Valley based innovation could be a kind of a religion and we need to invent something alternative, something else, uh, right? And uh, um, as a, another keynote, we had the European Union coming to say, yeah, how we can use APIs in technology to actually make that alternative. And now we have our ending keynote, Andy Russell. Hello, Andy, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. I'm doing really well. I love Great. how you store your books, right? By color or by size. I love it. Right. Thank you. Uh, mine, I don't want you to see mine here. Uh, it's not as well organized, but uh, yeah. And just to say, I have yours here. Oh, the other side. Uh, and up, upside down, there right? We go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Beautiful. innovation, right? That, uh, yeah, you got one here. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. uh, let's do teletransportation, right? And just to say, yeah, this is about this book that's new. Uh, it's all your work about uh, maintenance versus innovation. You are one of the co-founder of the maintainers.org group with uh, Lee Vincel, uh, mm -hmm. uh, right? And yes, we're really glad to have you here to end, you know, this conference about IT transformation, APIs, COVID-19 crisis. We've seen many people maintaining the system. Where were the innovators in this time? So yeah, I think it, it's a... Uh, Nothing better, no one better than you uh, uh, um, can can finish this this conference and talk about that topic. I invite you to share your slide. Okay. Here we go. You see okay? Yeah, perfect. Your full screen. Thank Great. you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Mehdi. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, really appreciate getting the opportunity to um, to talk to you all. I'll, I'll go too long if I don't look at my clock here. So um, I'm going to present some insights from our book, The Innovation Delusion, How Our Obsession with Anu Has Disrupted the Work That Matters Most. Here's how to contact me by email on Twitter. There's how you can get the book if you're interested in hearing more. Um, the most important things I, I need to say, are, I'll say right on this slide. First, thank you, Mehdi. Uh, for inviting me, for your kind introduction, and for your persistent dedication, not only to API days, but to uh, maintenance and maintainers and uh, to building a community. It's, it's really remarkable. Uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you to the team at API days. So many people uh, behind the scenes handling registrations, handling speakers, handling technical problems, all of that. Thank you uh, staff, thank you, attendees. You're doing really, really wonderful job, and and the the conference, as far as I've seen, has been terrific. And finally, thank you, maintainers. Um, these are the people I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes who really keep our society going, our high tech and low tech society going. So uh, I want to thank everyone who's who's keeping me comfortable and healthy and safe. And I would encourage everyone listening to do the same. So here's the book, and I want to start uh, as we start the book with um, one of the icons of Silicon Valley, as, as many just mentioned, um, that approach. And I'm sure you've seen this quote a lot of times, move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. Over the years, it's not been clear that that's a successful approach, even for software. It's certainly not a successful approach for building bridges uh, or building many things in our, um, in our physical world. So here's an example of a bridge that collapsed in Miami that was hailed as an innovative bridge, uh, but it collapsed causing a loss of life. And so I, I emphasize this at the start because I wanna be sure that we're not learning the, long, the wrong lessons from Silicon Valley and from the people who have, become, who have come before us in software. So I've got three main points that I'm gonna talk about in the next few minutes. The first is the puzzle of innovation speak and the difference between innovation and innovation speak. The second is how the innovation delusion suffocates maintenance and maintainers. And the third then um, after having established the problems in, in parts one and two is to encourage you to adopt a maintenance mindset. And I'll illustrate what that means in a, in a variety of examples. So first, innovation versus innovation speak. 
when we talk about innovation, uh, I like to start with actual innovation. And if you've thought about this, I'm sure you've encountered the work of Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist, um, who pointed out that innovation can take many forms. It's a new product or service, a new method of production, a new source of supply. He was writing in the early 20th century, so he was thinking in industrial age terms, not digital age terms, a new market or application, and a new method of organization. Any of these things count um, towards innovation. And Schumpeter made a, a pretty um, strong point that innovation is greater than invention. An invention is a singular um, thing. In innovation, uh, to be innovative, it requires a system for uh, delivering it and getting it into the hands of consumers and generating profit um, for the people who, who have initiated it. So one of the classic examples is the light bulb on its own, it's useless. Um, Edison's great insight as an innovator was to help develop a system of electric power, of um, all sorts of appliances that used uh, electric power and light and to, and to sell that to people. Uh, Schumpeter uh, liked to point out that innovation is a driver of change. It generates prosperity uh, for entire societies, often for the better, but not always for the better. And so I wanna talk about breaking um, some of the links that you might have in your head uh, that our culture certainly reinforces between innovation and progress. So let's think a minute about innovation speak. Innovation speak is uh, quite simply a sales pitch that consists of buzzwords and gibberish. It's often cast in the language of fear, fear of missing out or fear that uh, we're slipping behind. So um, in the United States, Ryan, we hear regularly that uh, the US is losing the, the AI race against China. So we need to be more innovative. Uh, one of the best, uh, best known books in Silicon Valley is uh, Only the Paranoid Survive by one of the founders of Intel. So that's the idea. It's a language of fear and it's often pushed by consultants. So here's a picture of Clayton Christensen. He coined the term disruptive innovation. Um, and I'm sure all of you know all about disruption and disrupt, and maybe some of you aspire to be disruptors. Uh, but Christensen also sold these ideas in his consulting business, he, he and other people. So um, there's always a sales pitch and there's a difference there between the sales pitch and the thing being sold. And I wanna make sure that distinction is clear for you. Now, um, some companies do a terrific job at innovating. For example, Enron, the American energy company was named by Fortune magazine as the most innovative company six years in a row. But as you all probably know, Enron ended um, with a spectacular uh, failure, a verdict of fraud and conspiracy against Ken Lay, um, Skilling and, and others at the company. So this brings us to the title of the book and the uh, big point that I want to make to you, which is that the innovation delusion is the mistaken notion that innovation can cure all problems, that it, that it presents a positive <laughs> point of progress from a problem to a solution. And as we've seen from just the, uh, the example of Enron, that's not true. Now, one of the costs of the innovation delusion is that it suffocates maintenance and maintainers. And I wanna talk through um, what I mean by this in, in the next few slides. So let me first uh, talk about maintenance. And, and here's some of the heroes of, of our story here. And, and throughout the book, The Innovation Delusion, we talk about innovation and maintenance along three scales. The broadest scale is the level of society or infrastructure represented here by the famous um, picture of uh, the painter in the Eiffel Tower. Um, and I wish I could say it's right down the street, but uh, it's, I'm, I'm quite far away from Paris right now. Uh, the mesoscale is companies and organizations, and the picture in the middle here is of airplane maintenance uh, of, of vital importance, uh, both in the private and, and public sectors in terms of um, military. And then the smallest scale is individuals, and the illustration or the picture on the right is of two medical professionals in a Brooklyn hospital obviously in the year of 2020, um, head to toe in, uh, in PPE. So maintenance occurs at multiple levels in society, and it's these maintainers who perform the vital task. Now, one of the things that, that suffocates maintenance um, and maintainers is short-term thinking. 
Short-term thinking has evolutionary roots, arguably. Um, the, the environment, uh, some uh, psychologists and other theorists speculate um, favored people who thought um, in terms of immediate interests as opposed to long-term interests. Uh, but we also see contemporary incentives for short-term thinking across these three scales that I uh, just mentioned earlier, societies, organizations, and individuals. And so I wanna talk about these and give you some examples. The bottom line here is that we're kind of in a pinch in our society right now. We're in a bind because from business and culture, we see incentives everywhere to innovate and disrupt. But in our experience and our aspirations, we have incentives to maintain and to care. So a lack of recognition of maintenance and a lack of recognition for maintainers is a clear recipe for disaster. And I'm gonna talk about some of the, the um, problems that have resulted here, uh, again, following the three scales. So uh, people familiar with the American Infrastructure um, Report Card uh, published every year by the American Society of Civil Engineers are familiar with the fact that uh, America's infrastructure regularly gets a D plus. Uh, those of you in, in education know that a D plus is just a, a lazy way of saying an F. Um, this report card is really interesting. It cuts from the digital to sewers, to uh, waterways, to power, roads, bridges, and so on. Um, so one of the most innovative countries in the world, arguably the most innovative country in the world, uh, rates itself as getting a D plus for its infrastructure. We see this uh, playing out at the local level sometimes. Strong Towns is an organization headed by Chuck Marone who wrote this terrific essay called The Growth Ponzi Scheme. And what this essay demonstrates very clearly is that huge investments, billion or trillion dollar investments sometimes in infrastructure can build roads, can build bridges, but it also builds long-term liabilities that we're not well positioned to, um, to sustain and to meet. So at the meso level, General Electric is a company, um, you know, it's, it's, tough to, it's tough to say, but you gotta feel a little bad for them. In 2016, they started on a campaign to rebrand itself as a 124 year old software startup. They wanted to get um, their share of the investment that was going towards Silicon Valley companies. They wanted to appear young and agile and digital, um, but it didn't really work out too well. By 2018, a leading business publication just referred to them as a general disappointment. And they had uh, somehow both neglected their traditional business, but also failed in their mission to adopt a fail fast mentality and to be seen as nimble and as attractive for investment as the Silicon Valley companies that are, that are growing really quickly. So General Electric lost itself because it was chasing this innovation and growth delusion. Closer to home for me, I'm an academic. Uh, we've seen in the United States and all over the world a proliferation of innovation campuses. This one is at the University of Pennsylvania in this <laughs> cringeworthy uh, title, Penovation, um, on an old building that, uh, that they've you know, put on some paint and some modern design elements. What, that, what happens at universities is that universities put a lot of money into trying to be innovative without much evidence that it's going to actually return revenue on that investment. But in the meantime, they neglect some of their core capabilities, um, such as the humanities and arts, or even the basics of science and math that engineers and scientists need to succeed. And this is a struggle that I deal with every day. I could, I could tell you all about it. This is unfortunate because we know better. We know better from data, for example. This chart shows um, the allocation of software effort published by Nathan Ensmanger at our first maintainers conference in 2016. This is based on studies that started in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the early days of software engineering, where Barry Baim, the, the father of software engineering, um, saw a, a result over and over again that between 16 80% of firms uh, of effort in firms were going towards maintenance of software effort. Okay, not towards the innovative or design aspects that, um, that get a lot of the attention. So, and I've never seen any study that refutes this. I've seen plenty that, that replicate this result. Um, so we know better from data and we actually know better from our own personal experience. 
So again, I'm picking on Americans. This chart demonstrates a, a, a progression in obesity amongst the US adults, a result of short-term thinking and not thinking, um, not applying what we know about uh, nutrition and exercise and health. We also see this trend evident in the average size of a new US home where we've almost tripled the sizes of new homes in the United States since 1950, almost doubled them in size since 1970. And just like the highways and bridges I was talking about earlier, the more house you have, the more you need to maintain and the more you need to budget um, and spend on, on those costs, whether it's uh, the roof that you need to replace periodically, or the paint, uh, all of the different troubles that come with with a dwelling, including the, the infrastructure of the house, right? The, the things that handle the heat and the water and so on. <clears throat> the final point I wanna make in, in this part is that we experience this also as, as we age. In this wonderful book by Atul Gawande called Being Mortal, demonstrates the problems that uh, the field of gerontology is facing. Gerontology is, is elder care and uh, people and resources have been fleeing that field because they've been going to higher status and higher paying areas of, of surgery um, and all sorts of areas that are, that are more sexy or more appealing and more lucrative. And as a result, uh, there's a systematic lack of attention about elder care and end of life issues that we have unfortunately seen uh, with tragic consequences um, during this pandemic. So again, this is a recipe for disaster, not only for material things, but for um, human lives and well-being. And um, in keeping with the comments on the pandemic, um, we've also seen that the people who carry the burden of work uh, are disproportionately people of color, women, and immigrants. So here's a study from San Francisco, another from New York, uh, a nationwide study documented the same thing, and so did a study from Texas about frontline workers. So at a time when we need maintainers the most, um, we have found that they're, they're underpaid and they're groups that have been systematically um, discriminated against and disadvantaged um, throughout uh, American history. Okay, so what can we do to make things better? How can we adopt a maintenance mindset? And when we talk about the maintenance mindset in the book, we talk about three basic principles. The first is coming to grips with reality, that maintenance sustains success. The second is that maintenance depends on culture and management. And the third is that maintenance requires constant care. It's not a one-shot deal. So let me take each of these three in turn. First, maintenance sustains success. Again, intuitively, we know uh, the old proverb, an ounce of prevention equals uh, a pound of care. Um, this has been quantified in study after study after study um, where we see triple figure returns on investment um, for maintenance contracts. A small maintenance contract can help a company avoid a massive uh, replacement cost and costs in downtime as well. High reliability organizations are already good at this. They're already good at, at communicating internally the value of maintenance and reliability and you know and depend on these organizations. So when AWS goes down for a few hours in a region, it makes national or international news. Um, if, if there's jitter in Netflix, they hear about it. Uh, Netflix engineers actually invented the field of chaos engineering, as some of you may well know. Uh, and it's the same with, with uh, in the aerospace industry or the US Air Force. They invest huge billions of dollars in maintenance and reliability. And just think of um, a hospital, an emergency room or a, or a surgery room, if the air handler goes down or if a pump providing water goes down, this is really a matter of life and death. So high reliability organizations understand this, they invest massive amounts of money in it. And you know, if I were to tell a CEO or, or a, a COO at one of these companies, you need to think about maintenance, they have just told me, you know, here are all the ways that we already invest in it and that it benefits our customers and our patients and our constituents. So the first step is to come to, uh, to grips with the data. The second is to reinforce the message about maintenance throughout the organization. And this is really a matter of culture and management. 
Now, when Lee and I have talked to groups of professionals uh, who do maintenance and reliability for a living, they say over and over again, you know, the technical challenges are there, but we know how a lot of this stuff actually works and we know what we need to do. It's the soft stuff that's the hard stuff. It's communicating, it's um, creating a culture, and it's um, reinforcing that culture throughout the organization that maintenance is really important. So this is, this is what um, groups like SMRP see as one of their most uh, difficult challenges. Other organizations approach this uh, differently. FIX is a, um, a computerized maintenance management software company based in Toronto. And when I interviewed the founder of FIX for our book, he told us that sustainability and maintenance are the same word, um, that basically they're a sustainability company. And what that framing does is it helps him um, recruit and retain uh, employees who are excited about sustainability and really want to help the challenge of climate change. But it also helps reinforce why maintenance is important. It's a means to an end. And that end is um, sustainability and value for um, the natural environment. The third principle is that maintenance requires constant care. Now in the industrial space, uh, there's books, there's charts, there's all kinds of things that you can use. Um, here's a book by one um, leading expert and consultant named Ricky Smith, Rules of Thumb for Maintenance and Reliability Engineers. Detailed plans about how to deal with um, pumps and bearings and he's got checklists, he's got all kinds of stuff in there, it's great. Um, for the digital age, you probably have interacted with um, one or another of these companies. Um, Upkeep is a mobile first maintenance management software company. Augury has been a leader in using artificial intelligence um, for predictive maintenance. So to, to know when a machine or a part's going to fail before it fails. Um, they've got all kinds of stories about, uh, you know, from diapers to beer about how they've prevented downtime and, uh, and prevented machine failures. And eMain is another company that, that has software um, I'm sure there's APIs, you know, I haven't looked that deeply into the API side of it, but I'm sure those are there. So, uh, so how do we do it? For infrastructure, fix it first. As I said before, don't just build, um, let's focus on fixing what we already have. And we've seen this with ventilators um, during the pandemic where uh, the US actually had a stockpile of ventilators, but they hadn't been properly maintained, so they couldn't be deployed. It's very important not only to thank essential workers or maintainers, but to ensure they're compensated appropriately and have access to the benefits that they need um, in, in their lives, whether it's childcare, health insurance, their own health care, uh, the PPE, any of that stuff. Um, that is, is really fundamental for, um, for all walks of life all around the world. In the United States, we have a, a special problem with our healthcare system, it's well known, and, it, and COVID has exacerbated um, the, the problems in our care infrastructure. And so, um, you know, this is an important policy point that I'm sure is on the agenda of the incoming Biden administration. As individuals, um, there's really strong links between maintenance and reliability and the causes of repair. Uh, the right to repair movement is sweeping the world and individuals can um, can do a lot more uh, to have stuff without breaking the planet, uh, to use the subtitle of Sandra Goldmark's really great book. So um, we just did a, uh, a video with iFixit um, with the authors of, of these two books and I would encourage you to go on iFixit's YouTube page to, to find that, it's a lot of fun. So I wanna end with um, some reflections on how to apply maintenance and care when you uh, leave this, this conference and, and go back to work and, and dealing with APIs in all of their various forms. And the first is uh, don't buy into the Silicon Valley model. Don't be a disruptor. This model has steep costs and has led to devastating consequences, both for the region itself as well as for the many workers um, who have been involved there. Yes, it's produced benefits. Yes, it's produced wealth, uh, but you really need to think about the cost there. Second is that you are bridge builders. You remember the initial slide where I had Mark Zuckerberg saying to move fast and break things on the one hand and then a broken bridge on the other. I see people working in APIs as bridge builders, and it's very important for you to be thinking long-term and rigorously and seriously about these bridges that you're building. 
Third is that I do believe you're innovators and that actual innovation is incremental, it's evolutionary, it's adaptive, and it's sustainable. There are very, very few cases where it's disruptive. So please don't be a disruptor, be a maintainer. You can catch up with me um, at this email address here, at the maintainers with Lee and Jessica, we are building the movement for maintenance thinking and action, and we would love to see you get involved. Um, that's the book. Thank you, Medi. Thank you, API Days. And thank you, all maintainers. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for this. Uh, we have time for uh, uh, two quick uh, uh, questions uh, uh, to respect your, uh, your time there. Uh, so one first question is, uh, the more we actually, as you say, you showed with houses. So can you unshare your screen so we can see our face better? So if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah. So the more we invest in in stuff, right now, you know, for example, uh, oil powered gas or uh, the house system, the road system. Actually, we 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 avoid the, the a better system to come because we put so many money into maintaining what we what we got. So how do we how do we are sure that uh, actually what do we maintain is is sustainable? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because we don't have endless resources and we've already inherited um, tremendous amount of, of debt and obligations from past generations. Um, in software, you, you have this nice term technical debt um, and that kind of gets to it. But like you said, you know, it's it's everywhere around us. So, I, you know, I think, first of all, it's coming to grips with with what we owe. Uh, our, our current generations and our future generations. But then as we build new things, it's, it's really applying long-term thinking into what we're designing. So um, it's, it's building things to be maintainable. Um, so this is, you know, this is applicable in, in architecture. At, at the Maintainers 3 conference, we had um, an architect talk about how he would design walls so that in 30 years, you could get to the conduit, you could get to all the different pipes. And I can imagine that there's that there's analogs in, in software as well, using standard tools, documenting things appropriately, and making sure that um, that your your spend is sustainable, that you're not just going to run out of money and have some, some invisible uh, business plan to come up with resources down the line that's gonna save everyone. This morning we had the Diego Landivar uh, and Alexandre Monin who are who tried to build this try to build this bank of uh, uh, disinvest disinvestment. Like he said, oh, if innovation are not sustainable, we should invest to remove them, right? For more maintainable uh, stuff. So shifting from, let's say they call they call them dead alive innovation. They are alive, but they are dead on the um, inside, right? You know, they they are not they will not be able to 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 move. So do you did you see any? Kind of funding from that sort yeah you know um this is one of the things that i like to do you probably noticed during the presentation is is to draw attention to uh digital and physical or to point out that um that there's connections between the two and that the things that say nurses and engineers are experiencing in the physical world is the same thing that programmers are experiencing in the in the digital world right so um so the I say that because the example that jumps to mind is coal, uh, coal plants, coal-fired power plants, which are things that um, we need to get rid of, right? They're not sustainable for the planet. They're, they're part of the cause of killing the planet. But we can't, we, we have to do it reliably and responsibly. We can't just shut off the switch and walk away because um, it would cause tremendous damage to those facilities and to the the area around them, as well as to the people and communities that depend on them. So yes, yeah, shutting things down costs money. You know, there's no doubt about it, but it is the, if it's the responsible thing to do, then it's something that it's incumbent on leaders to understand and to resource appropriately so that we can do it and move on. Yep. The, you know, there is a saying like, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, if you think it's expensive to hire a good consultant, uh, right. Think about how expensive it is to hire a bad one. Right. <laughs> yep. You know, that idea. So would you say the same for innovation and, and maintenance? You know, maintenance is expensive. Yes. But uh, it's more expensive. If you don't do it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And this has been shown time and time again. Um, so many so many studies that demonstrate it, um, that, that pro the proactive approach is just far superior because 
um, the costs, uh, well, the AWS example, you know, the costs of failure, the costs of downtime, not only means that you're losing money at that particular point, but you're losing reputation. And in some industries, especially um, uh, high reliability industries, reputation is everything. You know, just ask Boeing, ask Union Carbide, um, ask any of these things that have experienced uh, downtime or disasters, um, and it's a killer. So uh, yeah, it's all about um, making smart decisions up front and having some uh, vision really for how these things will play out in the long term. So the, the consultant example is a, is a great example. You know, hu human resources is a very important function for organizations. And, and, and I don't know if you've seen, I'm sure you have, but for example, Canada has uh, declared uh, essential workers a specific status during the COVID-19. And even in France, for example, people who were caring about others or maintaining system who were immigrants, you know, resident, but not French now can apply for citizenship with a faster, faster thing. So there, it begins that we begin to thank, to thanks uh, maintainers, right, for what they did. I will just finish with, with one uh, uh, question for you about uh, conservatism, right? Because maintaining is, 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 is good most of the time, but sometimes it's a void, You know, because people are not in the next wave, they are they are in fear of being disrupted, right? They this they want to keep it as is, where actually it could be a progress to uh, in that direction. So, what advice you could say to maintainers, right, who sometimes try to maintain because they don't know what's next, and to avoid like conservatism or Luddites, you know, like Luddites movement. Yeah. So so there is um, fear everywhere. Um, and there's uh, the fear of what happens if we don't innovate, and there's the fear of what happens if we do innovate because we leave things behind. And, um, you know, th these things always take conversation is, is what I would say. So um, sometimes it's not so easy just to convince someone who's been caring for a system for a long time. You say, hey, you, you got to stop doing that. You need to do something else. Um, sometimes they need to see the data. Sometimes there needs to be a conversation with partners Um, so you, uh, you know, by brokering a conversation with customers or with with students, in, in our case, you know, to see students who are interested in having um, new programs, then we have to explain to faculty uh, they want something different than what you're offering. So it's time to change. Um, change is hard, yeah. But but I think using uh, kind of all options on the table approach, and really having it come from a community instead of just a point of fear. You must do this or bad things will happen to you. Um, I don't think that's a good style of leadership. I think more collaborative and consultative is, is the best approach there. Yeah, and onboarding maintainers into the next whatever innovation, like being sure that they are part of it, inclusive innovation, you know, more yep. than disruptive innovation, right? Yeah, and, and DevOps has done a good job um, with that framing because it uh, there, there's status differences. You know, you have a very small amount of the elite programmers, and then you have everybody else who actually keeps things working. And so if leaders can break down those status divisions, uh, then I think a healthier culture will result. Yeah. Andy, that was great. Thank you very much uh, for this. Again, uh, the book is here in the Innovation Delusion, uh, right? And I really advise this book uh, uh, to, to be read. Uh, so now it's time to wrap up the conference. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Thank you very much. much.